Tonight, the issues and the controversy. A thousand people have gathered at the City College of New York for a town meeting with Nelson Mandela. So Mr. Nelson Mandela, a free man, taking his first steps into a new South Africa. Nelson Mandela, welcome to me. May I help you? You got to get 40 young men and women just for the placards. You know, everybody's excited now by Mandela, so they'll do it. You're here to help? Are you reporting to work? Okay. The tickets have. Uh, been received, but she needs to send someone down to the Mandela reception office for them. And you're on your way. Welcome Mandela to the Bronx. We need to welcome. Welcome Mandela to the Bronx. Hi there, brother. You coming out Thursday? Welcome Mandela. What do you know about Mandela? Well, uh, he was put in jail in South Africa because he believed in freedom. Now is the time to intensify the struggle on all fronts. Spend uh, 27 years at the prime of your life is a tragedy. And uh, I regret, you know, those years that I have wasted in prison. Tell me, how are we doing on uh, Eddie Murphy and on Robert De Niro and on uh, Robin Williams and the rest? The opening act is going to be the Amigo, Amico Renegades, which is the steel please. band. Then Tracy Chapman comes on with her band. We're flying her in. And then Mr. Mandela does his speech. Together! We must pledge to continue our united efforts for the abolition of the apartheid system. You can see the increase in the confetti and in the ticker tape coming out of the windows. And here is Nelson Mandela. Apartheid is doomed. And now, Thursday, June 21st, Nelson Mandela comes to Harlem. Seven years ago, while he was still in prison in South Africa, Mandela was awarded an honorary doctorate in absentia at this university. Today, he comes to the City College of New York in person to participate in a town meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, Nelson Mandela. Report, a town meeting with Nelson Mandela. 
Mr. Mandela, you're participating in what is a very old and honorable American tradition, the town meeting. And rather than waste any time with my questions, if they don't ask you good ones, I promise I will try to. But I think we have some people out here who have some provocative and perhaps even controversial questions to ask you. And I'd like to begin. Mr. Mandela, you've come to the United States of America. Other than South Africa, probably the most racially divided country in the world. Evidence of that is right here in New York City. We are one of the most racially divided cities in the world. The blood of our children stained the sidewalks of New York. Howard Beach, Benson Hurst, Yusef Hawkins, Michael Griffith, our grandmothers, Eleanor Bumpers, mothers, Yvonne Smallwood. Do you think that this country, given its racial record and current history, can assume the real credible and moral leadership in the fight against apartheid because its hypocrisy is well known and one wonders whether it can really do what we want it to do and if it can what role can we as Africans in America play? If I may just ask you uh, for your indulgence if you'd be good enough, there will be some questions you'll like, there'll be some questions you won't like. Let me just ask you, though, to save the time so that we can listen to Mandela's answers. Mr. Mandela's answers. Mr. Mandela. After the rousing welcome I have received here, I do not know whether I am in a mood to think coolly. I have been deeply touched by this warm welcome. But to respond to the question, I must say that uh, the ANC and in fact uh, the entire mass democratic movement in South Africa condemns racialism wherever it may be found. We are fighting a special kind of racialism in our own country and we expect uh, all people who are the victims of racialism to fight that evil. But I am here and I am primarily concerned with what the people of the USA and its organs of government are doing to promote the struggle against apartheid in our country. And I must say to you, that uh, we have the support not only of the masses of the people, we have the support of the Congress as well as the government. And I think that uh, it would not be proper for me to delve into the controversial issues which are tearing the society of this country apart. I am sure that uh, the USA has produced a competent leaders of all, uh, of all population groups who are able to handle their own affairs very effectively. Let me follow up, if I may, on part of your answer. You say you're sure you have the support of the people, the Congress, and the leadership. The, by the leadership, do you also mean the President of the United States? Are you satisfied that you have his support? Well, I am sure of one thing that uh, he condemns apartheid as I do. That is enough for us to find further common room with the president. And this is the message that I'm going to put to him when I meet him. And when you say you have the support of Congress, are you satisfied that you have enough votes in Congress to keep sanctions that in place? That I cannot say that lies in the future. But when I address Congress, the main thrust of my speech is that the Congress should support sanctions. Why are you so insistent, Mr. Mandela, and then we'll go to a question at this microphone over here. <clears throat> Why are you so insistent upon maintaining sanctions at a time when it can be argued that the South African government has made more concessions, your release being only one of them, than it has ever made in the past 40 years? I should know better about this matter, Mr. Coppel, than you. No doubt. I, 
After all, it is the ANC, not the government, that is responsible for the present talks. We have been hammering the government since 1986 to meet us. And in spite of the humiliating and insulting conditions they tried to impose on us before they could agree to meeting us, we nevertheless had sufficient patience and sufficient commitment to peace as to continue hammering them to meet us. They have eventually done so, but despite the fact that uh, the talks are now uh, on, apartheid is still in place. The police are still killing our people, as they've done over the years. Vigilante groups are openly arming themselves for the specific purpose of attacking progressive groups and progressive leaders. The right wing is also arming it itself openly, and they say they are doing so for the purpose of destroying the ANC. They are calling for some of us to be hanged. Why would you think that uh, we should now relax our strategies? What has happened? Let's move on to the next question. Amanta. My name is Gloria Toot. I was born here in Harlem. I'm a lawyer. I've lived here all my life. I'm also on the board of directors of uh, the African Educational Foundation that's raising money to train the people of Africa for industry. I am concerned about the future economy of South Africa. I am concerned when I look at the newer countries that gained their freedom so hard fought, indeed did not demonstrate sound fiscal policy. Illiteracy is still quite large and hunger. What can assure me as a human being and a concerned African American that the ANC will indeed have a fiscal solvent policy that will continue the use of the resources of South Africa in a meaningful way? Or should I put it more succinctly, will your economy be based on the Marxist system, socialism, or capitalism, or both? I knew that the, that, that was the question you wanted to ask. <laughs> I am happy that you have had the courage to put it directly. <laughs> we are not concerned with models. We are not concerned with labels. We are practical men and women whose solutions are dictated by the actual conditions existing in our country. As somebody has said, we do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. <clears throat> if, if I may... What we want, what we want to achieve is a healthy and vibrant economy, which can ensure full employment to our people maximum production, and uh, the development of social justice. We wanted to rectify the imbalances that exist in our economy. One of the companies, well-known companies in the country, one company owns more than 75% of the shares quoted in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. This is illustrative of how our economy is organized. It is more, the, the, the resources of the country are monopolized by a white minority, even in that minority by a few individuals. Whereas the masses of the people, especially blacks, are left poor, ridden with disease, illiteracy, without educational facilities. We wanted to develop an economy which will put an end to that and will leave to other people 
to put a label if they so wish. Mr. Mandela, forgive me. <laughs> we have to take a short break. We'll be, we'll be just, we'll be back in just a moment. Thank you. The Couple Report, a town meeting with Nelson Mandela from City College in New York, continues. And we are back once again. And uh, Mr. Mandela, as I told you before we began this broadcast, uh, almost all the questions will be coming here from the audience. But we also went to a couple of people back in South Africa, told them you were going to be on the broadcast, and asked them if they had any questions for you or comments that they wanted to make to you. One of those from whom we are about to hear now, and I'd like you to address your attention over to that monitor is a man by the name of Koos van der Merwe, who's one of the leaders of the Conservative Party. Have a listen to what he has to say. Hello, Nelson. I'm a South African. I'm an Afrikaner. I want self-determination for my people in a part of South Africa. You can't have the whole South Africa for yourself. A part of it belongs to my people. Nelson, you're not going to nationalize the assets of the white people. I have worked for my banks, my mines, my businesses, and my farms. You are not going to take it. Stop your violence. Stop your sanction campaign. Stop your nonsense. Leave the violent campaign alone. And come and sit down, become a normal person, and talk, and maybe that way we can find solutions. And lastly, forget communism, Nelson, it's gone. And I hope you will be well. I believe you were ill. I hope you will recover and have a good journey. van <laughs> harte. <laughs> A dat een dag ik de geleendheid zal krijgen om met u te gezellig. Yeah. Well, just to interpret Please. what I said, <laughs> I just wanted to demonstrate that I am bilingual. All I have said to Kurs van der Merwe is to say I am happy to know you. I hope that one day we shall have the opportunity to discuss the affairs of our country. That is all. Now, let me pick up, if I may, Mr. Mandela, though, on, on what Kurs van der Merwe had to say. He represents, as you know, a small but significant segment of the white population in South Africa, which is pressuring Mr. de Klerk from that political side of the spectrum. To what degree do you feel any need to help President de Klerk deal with people like Kuz van der Mel? Mr. de Klerk is an independent Resource, resourceful and flexible leader. He is able on his own to deal with the right wing. The outside world will be making a grave mistake if they think they can do anything whatsoever to help Mr. de Klerk as against the right wing. In fact, for the international community to seek to do anything expressly to help Mr. de Klerk would be the best way of undermining him. Because what the right wing is doing is to tell the whites in South Africa that de Klerk is a puppet of the United States and Great Britain. And that what is doing now is precisely because he has received instructions from those two countries. 
And if now the Western world comes out to say they want to help the clerk, that is what the right wing exactly wants. You will destroy him. We, the ANC, are the only people who can help him. And we are doing our very best to help him. One of the points we are putting to him is that uh, Mr. De Klerk, if he wants to see the future non-racial South Africa emerging, is to speed up in regard uh, to the negotiating process, that uh, in a year or two, he should be able to extend the vote to all South Africans. He must cease uh, thinking in terms of solutions by seeking a mandate to whites only. He must place himself in a position where he can get the support of the overwhelming majority of the people of South Africa. And if he gives every man and woman, whatever the color of his skin, the right to vote, he will be in an extremely strong position and there's nothing that the right wing can do. But if he continues, as he is doing at the present moment, still to think of racist solutions, solutions which are seen first and foremost as protecting the rights of the whites, he will go under. Let us move on to our next questioner at the microphone over there. Mr. Welcome to America, Mr. Mandela. I'm Ken Edelman. Those of us who share your struggle for human rights and against apartheid have been somewhat disappointed by the models of human rights that you have held up since being released in jail. You've met over the last six months three times with Yasser Arafat, who you have praised. You have told Gaddafi that you share the view on, and applaud him on his record of human rights and his drive for freedom and peace around the world. And you have praised Fidel Castro as a leader of human rights and said that Cuba was one of the countries that's head and shoulders above all other countries in human rights, despite the fact that documents of the United Nations and elsewhere show that Cuba is one of the worst. I was just wondering, are these your models of leaders of human rights? And if so, would you want a Gaddafi or an Arafat or a Castro to be a future president of South Africa? One of the mistakes which some political analysts make is to think that their enemies should be our enemies. that we can and we will never do. We have our own struggle which we are conducting. We are grateful to the world for supporting our struggle. But nevertheless, we are an independent organization with its own policy. And the attitude of every country towards our attitude towards any country is determined by the attitude of that country to our struggle. Yasa yeah. Arafat. Colonel Gaddafi, Fidel Castro, support our struggle to the hilt. There is no reason whatsoever why we should have any hesitation about hailing their commitment to human rights as they are being demanded in South Africa. 
Our attitude is based solely on the fact that they fully support the anti-apartheid struggle. They do not support it only in rhetoric. They are placing resources at our disposal for us to win this struggle. That is the position. <laughs> Mr. Mandela, you've, uh, you've said a number of very controversial things in that last response, and I'd like to come back to some of them when we return, but once again, we have to take a quick break. We'll be back in a moment. Thank you. The Couple Report will continue in a moment. And we are back once again uh, with Nelson Mandela at the City College of New York. Mr. Mandela, as I mentioned to you before the program, we also have some distinguished guests sitting behind us, uh, one of whom, uh, Mr. Henry Sigmund, together with two other Jewish leaders, came to Geneva to visit with you precisely because they were so concerned not only by the kind of thing that you just said before the break with regard to Yasser Arafat, with regard to uh, Libya's Colonel Gaddafi, uh, but also because of the support uh, that you seemed at different times to give to the PLO. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Sigmund to, to stand now for a moment uh, and pose whatever question he would like directly to you. Mr. Sigmund? Before I pose my question, uh, permit me to say first that when I had the, the pleasure and honor of meeting with Mr. Mandela in Geneva, we said to him, and I would like to repeat this now, in order to put my question in context, that the commitment of the Jewish organizations that met with him to the struggle against apartheid, against racism, against injustice in South Africa, is absolutely unconditional. It is not dependent on whether we are happy or unhappy with responses that Mr. Mandela gives to some questions. Having said that, Having said that, I think I would be dishonest if I did not express profound disappointment with the answer that Mr. Mandela gave to the previous question, because it suggests a certain degree of amorality. The, it suggests that the, what these people do in their own countries, what a Gaddafi does in Libya, what a, what a uh, Castro does in Cuba is totally irrelevant even in terms of the issue of, of human rights as long as they support the cause of the ANC. I hope that is not what Mr. Mandela meant and I would hope that he would clarify that issue further. Mr. Mandela. Firstly, we are a liberation movement which is fully involved in a struggle to emancipate our people from one of the worst racial tyrannies the world has seen. We have no time to be looking into the internal affairs of other countries. It is unreasonable for anybody to think that this is our role. I have been asked by somebody who wants me to express an opinion on the differences that are taking place within the USA. And he has made his position quite clearly that there is racialism in this country. I have refused to be drawn into that. Why should Mr. Sigmund accept my refusal to be withdrawn into the internal affairs of the United States? And at the same time, want me to be involved in the internal affairs of Libya and uh, Cuba. I refuse to do that. 
As far as Yasser Arafat is concerned, I explained to Mr. Sidney that we identify with the PLO because just like ourselves, they are fighting for the right of self-determination. I went further, however, to say that the support for Yasser Arafat in his struggle does not mean that the ANC has ever doubted the right of Israel to exist as a state legally. We have stood quite openly and firmly for the right of that state to exist within secured borders. But, of course, as I said to Mr. Sigmund in Geneva and others, that we carefully define what we mean by secure borders. We do not mean that uh, Israel has the right to retain the territories they conquered from the Arab world, like the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, and uh, the West Bank. We don't agree with that. Those territories should be returned to the Arab people. Mr. Mandela. I also explained to Mr. Sigmund and company that in our organization, we have Jews. In fact, Mr. Gaddafi did not allow us to open our offices in Libya precisely because we had the courage to say to him, we work with the Jews in our organization. And he didn't uh, allow us to open an office until February this year when he had to accept us as we are. We are not prepared to be swayed by anybody. We have an independent policy which we accept no matter with whom we discuss. Mr. Mandela, let's move on to our next question. Welcome. My name is Malcolm Dunn. I'm from Plainfield, New Jersey, and I'm chairman of the United Minority Business Brain Trust of New Jersey and the national chairman of the American uh, Legal Defense Fund for the uh, uh, minority business organizations. I have a question that relates to our participation in business in this country. We who have gained the moxie and who have reached certain uh, levels of proficiency in business and education in various professions, uh, would like to know what can we offer? What can we who have been denied access, total absorption into the American system in those professions, what can we prepare ourselves to offer to you in the motherland given your attainment of the one vote, one person, one vote? I ask this in the context of Eastern European countries being free <coughs> and the money that was formerly sent to uh, uh, Africa is now being diverted to those Eastern European countries. I ask also in the context that though our country has opened up its doors to people of a lighter hue before they have absorbed us fully in this country. And if you have an answer to my question, please let me know who I can contact after this assemblage to keep up the dialogue. Thank you. The black people of America, of the USA, have a lot to offer the people of South Africa in the course of their struggle. Whatever disabilities you have in this country, at least you have been exposed to opportunities which we don't have. You have better educational facilities. There is no legal color bar in this country. And therefore, you have been able to acquire, in spite of your problems, 
you have been able to acquire expert knowledge, skills, which we require, especially when during the post-apartheid South Africa, you can help us a great deal by making that expertise available to us. As far as the question of who you can contact, keep in contact with in our country, that we can discuss after this occasion. All right. We're going to take another quick commercial break, and then we'll be back in a moment. The Koppel Report, a town meeting with Nelson Mandela, continues. Once again, Ted Koppel. Mr. Mandela, as I mentioned to you also uh, before you came out here this afternoon, uh, there are black leaders in South Africa with whom you and your organization have differences. One of them who represents uh, many of the Zulu people, political organization known as Inkata, as Gacha Butelezi. If you'd be good enough to direct your attention once again to the monitor and listen to what he has to say. I know, my dear, that you're not responsible for our not getting together. And I know that it's other people that have said, they've said, I'm not imagining it, they've said it in so many words that they don't want you and I to get together. But Madiba, all these years you have been incarcerated, you know we've been in touch. We all know that I've always paid tribute to you, that I've refused you know, to negotiate with any of the white leaders in this country for, for, for decades now, because I told them that it was an absolute non-negotiable that I, I can get to the conference table without you and your, our brothers who were incarcerated with you and others, and before the unbending of ANC, PAC, and other organizations. So I think in your absence, you might be interested to know that one of our brothers, who is very close to you, has been to see me. He'll have a certain message for you when you return. And I said to myself that it's absolutely up to you, because there's nothing that prevents you, even in the United States, to pick up a telephone and, and say hello and talk to me as we're doing ever since you left jail. Uh, Shanga, <clears throat> I do not think it correct for me to wash our dirty linen in a foreign country, even though it is somehow our own. I am hesitant to do that, even though here I have the feeling that I am among comrades in arms, brothers and sisters. One thing I would like to dispel with all the force at my command is that uh, there is no difference whatsoever between myself and my organization on the attitude towards Inkata and yourself in person. If I have not seen you, it is because of decisions which we have carefully discussed amongst ourselves and of which I am part. I, however, would like to repeat what you know. I have said on numerous occasions, I would like the ANC and Inkata to sit down and resolve our problems and end the violence that is going on today in Natal. But you know as well as I do that the question is no longer simple. The government has taken advantage of the differences between my organization and your organization. They are using those differences for the purpose of trying to eliminate the ANC 
and what they consider to be members of that organization who are a threat to white supremacy. That now is our problem. It is no longer just a question of me meeting you. I have asked Mr. de Klerk the simple question. I have said to him, you have a strong, efficient, and well-equipped army and police force. Can you tell me why the government has failed to suppress violence in which almost 4,000 blacks have been killed? <laughs> Mr. de Klerk has never been able to give a satisfactory answer to my question. I have told him, I've given him the answer. I have said to him, you have not suppressed this violence deliberately because you believe that by using these differences between these two organizations, you can crush your enemy number one, the ANC. That is your difficulty. And I must repeat to you, that is the main problem facing the people of South Africa. It is the involvement of the government and its police in the violence that is taking place in Natal. We have, Mr. Mandela, uh, I believe on microphone B over there, a former representative of the South African government. He was until very recently the Consul General here in New York. Would you like to come to the microphone and pose your question? That is so, Mr. Koppel. Mr. Mandela, as one who for a period of years has advocated your unconditional release, I want to say at the outset, I'm delighted to see you here in New York. Welcome. Thank you. Secondly, I also commend you for your loyalty to your friends, controversial though that may be. But in framing my question, in dealing with Natal in particular, I, as a white South African, am most concerned about the bloodletting, the carnage that is going on. And whilst I take the point that you have made that the police possibly and probably could do more, I do believe that the challenge or the ball is in your court, Mr. Mandela, because one cannot, we as South Africans cannot afford to have South Africans killing South Africans. We've got to have peace, harmony, a strong economy. We've got to hold out our hands to each other so we can build the new South Africa with a minimum of bitterness. I believe, sir, that you are the statesman who can do it. I would like to do, you to do it, and I'd like you to issue a call. I'd like you to extend the hand to Chief Gacha Butelezi, irrespective of political differences, irrespective of dirty linen, irrespective of what has gone before. I believe you owe it to each other and the country to see that we have a stable, secure platform on which to go forward together, white, black, and brown. I hope you agree. I do not consider your remarks as a lecture to me. Because, because you would know that it is the ANC and not the government that has compelled the government to sit down and talk peace with us.